morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today in the discussion that we're going to have, which will revolve around the ESG, how is the ESG landscape evolving specifically for the maritime industry. So I wanted to start by defining first the terms of the debate we're going to have today. I was uh, looking at a study from Deloitte that was focusing specifically on the shipping sector, so the ESG sub subject, but specifically on the shipping sector. And it was defined as the active corporate involvement and establishment of strategies and corporate practice that focus on environmental, social, and corporate governance issues. Overall, there's a lot of focus in our industry on the E component, on the E pillar of ESG, which reflects the environment. We will take a look in our panel with our panelists today with respect to the other two pillars. So what about the social component? What about the governance aspect, the governance pillar of ESG? We will also be discussing today in this panel aspects that relate to the financing, the financing portfolios specifically for the shipping industry. And we will get to hear a little bit more from the experience of the panelists today, whether the perception that companies which have a higher ESG rating actually have better access to financing. In this recent study, and as also according to Clarkson's, ESG financing was found to already contribute a significant component overall in the financing portfolio for the shipping industry. It was approximately 281 billion as of October 2021. So some of the questions that are relevant, do companies with a higher ESG rating actually have a better performance financially? So I've just given a flavor of some of the aspects that we will cover in today's panel. I will now start by introducing my fellow panelists. We have first Chiara Condi, who is the associate partner in climate change and sustainability services at EY. Haris Plakandonaki, who is the chief strategy officer at Starbulk Carriers. George Wells, who is the commercial head for structured deals and decarbonization at Cargill. Theodore Jadig, who is the managing director, CEO and president at DNB Markets. And Vagelis Rusos, who is the vice president commercial at Tafton Asset Management. So I'll start with Ted, it's the first question. DNB has an overall goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. In shipping specifically, I've seen that the goal is to reduce the portfolio's emissions intensity by one third from 2019 to 2030. Ted, do you want to tell us more in terms of how do you evaluate your clients' ESG? How is your organization supporting this evolution? That? Now it's on. <laughs> um, well, I, I think, you know, DNB takes a very um, a thorough and, and, and holistic look at its client base. Uh, certainly a client's uh, ESG performance uh, and focus on um, having a plan, executing a plan, communicating a plan, and, and having a governance structure uh, to, to ensure that a plan is being followed up uh, and, and reported on. Uh, these are increasingly important factors for us as we kind of um, prioritize client relationships. Um, I don't see that changing. I, I see it only, you know, continuing to, to increase. Uh, we spend a lot of time, uh, and this is more, I would say, on the bank side. I'm on the investment bank side. Uh, but the investment bank and the corporate bank work, you know, very closely together. Uh, you know, we are, we are joined at the hip, I like to say. Uh, and, uh, you know, the considerations that we have, whether we're approving a credit line for a customer or whether we're, you know, approving an underwriting mandate for that customer, we more or less go through the same process in terms of assessing, you know, where, where does this client stand on, on, the, uh, on the scale. Um, and companies are in transition with this. Some are farther ahead, some are not as far along, uh, but all are doing something about it because uh, they, they, there's no choice. Uh, at the end of the day, this is uh, about access to capital, uh, and, and, and um, you know, increasingly, uh, investors and banks uh, will 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 differentiate uh, in their in their business and and, and focus uh, on on the clients 
that are uh, over time performing in a better and more consistent way in, 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 in meeting the, uh, the requirements. That also then uh, is impacting you, you know, our, our statistics and how we report to the, uh, to the authorities in terms of how our loan portfolio is, is developing. So it's, um, it's um, an important consideration and, and will only increase as, as we go forward. Thank you. So I'm keeping the last uh, word, important consideration, and will increase. Um, I'll go next to Harris. I'll turn next to Harris from the issue owner perspective. Um, Starbulk, I've seen it was the first bulk carrier company that published the report back in 2018. Uh, you've recently published the third sustainability report. So perhaps you can tell us a bit more from the perspective of the ship owner. Where is the focus that you're placing more? Is it the E, the S, or the G in terms of the three pillars of ESG? Thank you, Anthe. And thank you to the Capital Link team for uh, inviting me here to speak today. So uh, allow me to address your question, Anthe, by giving a bit of a background on Starbucks' overall ESG strategy. So in the past, ESG was just part of what we were doing as a, as a company, which basically meant that we would be keeping track of our operational, financial, commercial performance separately, and then separately we would have an action plan on ESG. Now, this has nowadays completely changed. Nowadays, everything we do is integrated with ESG, every aspect of our business. And let me give you a few practical examples. Uh, we cannot be talking nowadays about good commercial results unless our vessels perform well, on the right ship safety score and on the greenhouse gas ranking of right ship, which is what our charters are asking for. Uh, then when it comes to our investors, they're very much interested in our corporate governance. Our financiers, as, as Ted mentioned, they are offering us preferential rates if we're able to link our loans with sustainability targets. And of course, we're not able to attract good people, to attract talent if we're not able to offer to our people, whether on board the vessel or in the office, a working environment that promotes their health, their safety, their security, their overall well-being. And moving forward, as it is well known, we have also the IMO targets, the EXI, the CII, and unless the vessels are able to comply with these targets, they will not be able to have valid trading certificates, which comes to show that by now ESG is an indispensable part of our strategy. Uh, and it is integrated into everything we do. Now, uh, let me touch upon each, each aspect of ESG separately. Starting with the E part, which is the environment, and as I think you've already mentioned, historically in the shipping industry, this has been the focus. And this has been mainly driven by the fact that uh, we have had as an industry so many environmental regulations in the past, whether we talked about ballast water treatment or sulfur emissions, and basically, ship owners were obliged to comply with these regulations in order to be able to trade. And we don't expect that the E uh, will have less of an importance in the future, especially because of the greenhouse gas strategy of the IMO. We have ahead of us the 2030 strategy, the short-term and medium-term goals of the and CII, and we also have the more longer-term strategy, the 2050 one. Uh, therefore, we expect that the environmental part of VSG will remain at the forefront. Now, having said that, especially in the last two and a half years, and because of the pandemic, we have seen also the S part, which is the society part, moving further up in the agenda of shipping companies. So, so we had as an industry to learn the hard way that if our people, uh, whether on the vessel or in the office, are not healthy and happy, we cannot have a good performance. And uh, unfortunately, the war that is taking place just next door, and which we do hope that it will end sooner or later than later, has forced us to highlight even further the societal part of, of VSG. Uh, so uh, health, safety, security, overall well-being is on top of the agenda of shipping companies nowadays as well. Which brings us then to the G part, which is governance. Now, if, if one were to look at the last uh, two, three decades across the globe, we would realize that the black swan events that we're seeing are not that rare anymore, and that black swans are basically the new reality. Uh, and this, in practice, means that companies need to be resilient in order to survive and to ensure their financial sustainability. Uh, and what does resilience mean in practice? Resilience means you need to have solid risk management practices in place. You need to have 
structures, you need to have processes and systems that are lean and efficient, you need good governance, transparency, you need to have controls in place. And at the same time, we're seeing that the pace of change uh, in the world today is, is uh, increasing dramatically. So companies, in order to be able to survive, they need to constantly reinvent themselves, they need to be flexible, they need to be agile, which again brings the G part of the equation further up again on the agenda. So, so in a nutshell, all three aspects of ESG are important for us. They are at the core of our strategy and of everything we do, and we firmly believe that the companies, the shipping companies that will embrace ESG early on, will be the ones that will have a competitive advantage in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. You touched upon you know, the social component and also the aspect what has happened after the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that this has had. Um, I'll turn next to Cara to cover also the reporting aspect, which is quite an important element around the ESG discussion. And I was, re I was recently reading the recently published sixth Global Institutional Investor Survey by EY. And I noticed one of the key findings was around the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic that actually it acted as a big catalyst for ESG, despite what someone may have thought before. So moving on to the reporting, uh, let me turn to Chiara and ask, where are the biggest challenges being encountered around reporting? And if there's any best practices you would like to share. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start a bit with uh, a background on what has been happening on, on ESG uh, disclosures for the past uh, almost 20 years. Uh, some might say it's a very big universe, some might say it's even a huge universe of different standards. Some are uh, sector specific, some are sector agnostic. The truth is that in the last two years we're seeing uh, a lot of momentum around the convergence of these standards. And this is very important because companies so far irrespectively of the industry that they were working in, uh, had a lot of confusion on, on which are the best standards to use around ESG reporting so that they can be comparable with their peers and other companies. So the two most prominent um, developments that we have around uh, ESG disclosures is the IFRS uh, sustainability disclosure standards that were announced uh, back in uh, the, the COP event in Glasgow. So now we have some uh, drafts on that, and then we have the European Sustainability Reporting Standards. It was just released uh, yesterday that we have the first exposure drafts. Uh, we also have the specific requirements from USSC for climate change disclosures. Now, the truth of the matter is that all of these initiatives really help companies to streamline the process. And there is a very, very basic uh, underlying assumption that uh, covers all of these standards, and that is the materiality analysis. The materiality analysis and more specifically the, the principle of double materiality. What this means in essence is that all of these standards cover two aspects of ESG. First of all, ESG is not the same for every sector. The most material topics of the sector uh, differentiate between different sectors. So the materiality brings the most material topics that create the most impact. And the double materiality, which is again very important for effective uh, disclosures, has to do with the fact that companies need to take into consideration two facts. A, the inside-out perspective, so how do their performance, their business model, their outputs affect sustainable development or specific aspects of sustainable development like climate, biodiversity, water, waste, social issues, etc. So how do your performance, your emissions affect inside out the climate crisis, for example. And then another important aspect that these standards bring in is how the climate challenge, for example, or other sustainability uh, challenges across the world impact the company itself. So what are the risks and opportunities that these sustainability aspects bring for, for corporations? Now, this is very important, and specifically regarding decarbonization for the shipping sector, we see a lot of emphasis placed on obviously reducing emissions and mitigating climate change and all the net zero ambitions, but there is another aspect coming from the outside in perspective that has a lot to do with what are the real uh, risks also in terms of the physical um, implications of climate change, not just the transition risks which imply the regulatory requirements for reducing emissions. So we see a lot of emphasis in that and that goes again for all sectors. So 
in order for disclosures to be effective to address the interest of investors and other stakeholders, they need to be strategic and they need to be linked uh, very uh, closely with the most material impacts both from, from, the both, from both perspectives, so both inside and outside in. So I think these are the most um, recent developments and important developments moving forward and best practices come to that effect. And you used the, the term risk management, which is an integral component around ESG, and it's probably the component that we have seen coming across more and more frequently after the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So moving from what historically we were looking more as the environment pillar, but also integrating strongly and more robustly the risk management aspects that extend, let's say, to the social and governance pillars much more strongly. Um, I'll turn to George next. Um, with Cargill's ambition uh, being to have the most sustainable food markets and some of the quantifiable goals that you have set as part of the strategy. Uh, so I've seen, for example, to improve the livelihoods of 10 million farmers by 2030 through training in sustainable agricultural practices or uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions in your operations by 10% by 2025. Um, I think it was more to, to share your view in terms of how are cargo owners influencing the way on ESG? Yes, thank you, Anthony. Yes, I mean, from a cargo point of view, uh, ESG is clearly, as other speakers have said, have been very central to our strategy for a long time. We've set ourselves ambitious targets. And I think the point you made about um, cargo's role or helping, we say that we want to help the world thrive, also shows the importance of shipping. Shipping and seafarers are what keeps us fed, are what keeps us warm. Without them, um, they're, they're essential um, to, to our way of life. Um, in terms of cargo owners, um, who are our customers, um, we, we sit in the middle of owners and, and the cargo owners, we're definitely seeing a very strong push um, coming down the supply chains to um, drive up standards um, of safety of, and also of environmental um, issues. I think the closer you get to the consumer, the more pressure there is to improve. And, and, but that is coming down. So if you take, for example, the, um, the example of the car industry, they, they, there is a big pressure on them to, to, to improve the um, environmental score of, of, of their production process. And that starts, for example, with now there are a lot of green aluminium products or greener steel products that use renewable energy in the production. But now, now they're, so they're, they're starting to look at their scope one emissions, but now they're also starting to look more at their scope three emissions. And that's where shipping comes in. They're pushing down the supply chain. So how do we transport our bauxite? Where does it come from? What's the emissions uh, associated with that? And I think what we're seeing is the first questions they ask is, what are the emissions associated with that? They don't know. There's been very little transparency around um, what they are and also around um, how they're calculated, how you need some consistency so you can compare across um, different industries and, and within the supply chain. So that's why I think one of the big changes um, I've seen the last few years in the industry's approach to ESG is it's become a lot more collaborative. It's become a lot more transparent. It's the, the whole supply chains are starting to, to come together. Um, when you have organizations like um, the Global Maritime Forum, Getting to Zero Coalition, the Mercer McKinley Motor Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, it's not just charterers and owners. It's charterers, owners, fuel suppliers, regulators, um, cargo owners, class societies. It's really it's the only way we're going to um, improve and, and, and solve, solve these problems. Um, if we go back to the cargo owners, as I said, the first question they ask is, what are our emissions? So I think things like, for example, the Sea Cargo Charter, which um, we're a signatory of, traits a sort of common, transparent baseline for measurement. And then once you have that, then you can start looking at ways of um, improving. And you have much more informed discussions with our customers around how we can make improvements to their supply chain and reduce and help them meet their goals to reduce emissions. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll stay also with the last sentence, which reflects more around how will the wider 
industry work together to be able to, to get us where we need to be, to achieve what we have ahead of us, which is one of the biggest changes, the biggest transformational decade that we have ahead. And this can only be achieved by all the industry, all the stakeholders working together. Vangelis, I'll turn to you next. Tafton has set up and abides by its responsible investment policy. Can you share from your perspective, how has the industry changed? How has the industry conversation and the wider stakeholder dialogue evolved in the recent years? And how has this impacted your organization? Thank you, Antti. Thanks to the Capital Link. Uh, so it, it, it's, an, it's an interesting question on uh, how the industry has evolved during the last years. With regards to discussing ESG, taking ESG in, in separation, uh, I think it's not, it's nothing new, but simply an uh, uh, an evolution of uh, of the C of the CSR uh, buzzword that was used prior to ESG, right? I think that uh, corporates or companies usually use buzzwords to uh, echo societal pressures, and uh, I think ESG is a natural progression from the CSR. Uh, the only exception here is that we, we've added that E in front of uh, the social and the governance that was uh, alluded to in the corporate social responsibility that everybody was talking uh, some years ago. Uh, so that I, I don't think it's, uh, it's a big change because shipping per se has been uh, very adept in environmental issues. Uh, so for a shipping company, uh, I think everything has been a natural progression. Now, with the E being added, there's a lot more uh, focus on environmental, not because there hasn't been before, but because now environmental aspects and climate change discussions are taking center, center, change, center stage in the, in the political arena. Right, so with that, we have seen uh, a lot more uh, environmental regulations coming in, regulations that were not expected, and regulations uh, that are, to a sense, abrupt and uh, could cause uh, some abrupt uh, results. Uh, so having been in a company that was really strong in the S and G, because of our nature, being a fund manager, we always had to be strong in the social and governance aspects uh, following the CSR uh, prior buzzword. Uh, we have to adjust, we have to adopt, but it's not been uh, really a, a hard way getting there. Uh, having said that, we are now applying ESG principles more or less in the same way we did in the past, but in a more formalized and uh, centralized way uh, and under a separate umbrella. We now have ESG principles applied separately, whereas in the past we had most of these principles applied in various aspects, uh, but without clear identification. Uh, now, how, how exactly that's changed? Uh, I'd say, uh, in a nutshell, we apply uh, the basic framework from the UN uh, principles of responsible for responsible investing uh, throughout the cycle of our operations, starting from fundraising, moving to investment evaluation, sourcing, uh, then to managing of deals, and then to divesting. Uh, in each individual phase and stage of these four or five stages of our cycles, uh, we, see, uh, we see some change, and I'll, I'll elaborate a bit in the beginning. Uh, when we talk about fundraising, as Ted alluded to in the, in the beginning, ESG principles are no longer a tick box. I don't know if they were aware, but it's now really obvious that they're not a tick box for investors. It's something that we have to pay uh, attention to, that's something that the investors pay attention to, and something that we have to be at the top of our game to be able to attract uh, the right funds and uh, the right amount of funds, if you like. Then when it comes to investing, uh, evaluating a, a particular investment, uh, we pay a lot more attention on how that ship performs environmentally and how that ship is placed within uh, the universe of its peers. Uh, 
uh, how efficient is that? Is it top quartile, is it uh, mid quartile, etc.? Uh, in the past, that was not a huge attention, but right now we would uh, favor uh, a higher, a better performer, mm -hmm. uh, even for a slightly less uh, return profile. Because we are, we are convinced that uh, a bad consumer uh, would be a liability going forward, both environmentally and, and financially, no matter what, what the numbers may show now. And then uh, when it comes to managing the ship, after acquiring the ship, uh, we now pay a lot more attention to our, our counterparties' ESG credentials. Uh, we we uh, make sure that whoever we choose to manage the ship or whoever we choose to uh, operate the ship from the chartering side is uh, a signatory to perhaps, for example, the Neptune Declaration uh, or the Sea Cargo Charter, as uh, George, uh, George has uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, so even in, in, in managing the ship, there's been some changes. Uh, another change that we are trying to, to bring in the industry is that we try to limit our exposure to coal. Uh, we're trying to uh, put a, a cap into the coal uh, cargoes that the ship may carry. So that's another thing that we have uh, moved into. Uh, and then also still in, management, in managing the ship and moving from the environmental to the S, uh, side of, uh, of ESG. Uh, there's a lot more focus now on uh, crew welfare, especially after the pandemic. Uh, there's been a huge push uh, to, for, 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 to relieve crews that have been stranded on board the ships. Uh, that's not part of our processes and something uh, that we really pay attention to. It's not in the, in the bottom of the agenda. It's moved uh, further up the agenda. Uh, so all these things, just summing up and going back to where I, I uh, begin with, uh, were things that we were doing in the past. Uh, everybody was doing all these things now. Uh, priorities might have changed a little bit, uh, but what has really changed is that we uh, have carved out and look at ESGs separately instead of, uh, you know, in between other processes and procedures. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And interesting talking about change. Um, I'll move next around the geopolitical events that have been happening and how has the impact been? So I'll turn to you, Ted. How have the geopolitical events in the past several months impacted the dialogue, the stakeholder consideration around the ESG sub subject? My opinion is they've, they've had a pretty dramatic impact on, on the dialogue, and, and I think they've, they've been a real wake-up call uh, for, for everybody who's paying attention, and I think most people are, to, to issues around uh, the environment, to issues around energy security, um, as, as opposed to energy transition. Um, Angelis talked about you know buzzwords, energy, energy, energy transition. I don't think it's a buzzword. It's it's clearly a trend, and it's a very important one. But I feel like energy security has 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 definitely crept into the uh, to the discussion um, more than crept in. I think it's it's barged through the door. So uh, you know the 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 turmoil that we're in right now. Um, if you take, if you go back six months, you know, or even longer, you know, the clouds, the clouds were forming on on, on the horizon. When you think about the, you know, the, the, the prospect of increased interest rates, uh, clearly the inflation that, that that is that is really really raging, um, and 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 then in addition, you know, the central banks all saying they, they're going to reduce their balance sheets. So all these forces were. You know, clearly beginning to impact the market as we came into 2022, um, and, and creating a much more volatile uh, situation in, in the capital markets. Um, the situation in, in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, has has only exacerbated uh, really all of those, and, and and really ratcheted up the pressure uh, around uh, supply chains in, in in many many products, but certainly energy uh, is is right at the top of the list and. It's 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 been a uh, it's been a very you know kind of stark reminder uh, that energy security and, 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 and countries are reacting. Energy security um, is really now taking you know center stage and, and top priority for particularly particularly Europe, um, and and this will 
you know, this will refocus um, attention on fossil fuels, uh, on oil and gas. Um, it doesn't mean the focus on renewables is going to lessen. I think, I think it will continue and will be, in, in fact, ratcheted up as well. Uh, but, you know, we, we have to walk and chew gum here. And I, and I think everybody is quite aware that if, if, if Europe is going to shift its, its energy dependence or its sources of energy to more secure, uh, you know, from more secure sources, um, that's going to require a dramatic shift and, and renewables are not going to be able to kind of step in and, and replace the amount of, of, of oil and gas that are, that are imported from Russia. So it's, 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 a new, it's a new element, it's a new kind of dimension in the ESG discussion, in the energy transition discussion. Um, but, but I think it, it takes, at least in the short and probably medium term, uh, a lot of prominence. Uh, and, 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 you know, I think markets have reacted to that. They've begun to react to that. The, you know, the oil and gas, the energy sectors have been the best performing, you know, sectors in the market, um, certainly in this year and, and really for a good part of at least the second half of, of 2021. Um, and that's equity valuations. Bond markets have opened up for companies in these sectors. Uh, they, they were closed for, you know, at least several years, you know, going into, into 2021. Uh, funds flow, fund flows uh, into non-ESG focused funds have outpaced flows into ESG focused funds over the last four quarters. That's reversing a trend that we had, you know, we had been experiencing beforehand where the ESG funds were really uh, getting, getting the lion's share of, 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 the, of the funds coming in. So financial markets, uh, you know, have reacted to, to you know, the, the situation, uh, you know, on the ground and, and again, I think, you know, the, the situation in Ukraine has only, um, has only exacerbated that. So, you know, again, I think, I, I think we, we're going to have much more focus on a dual track here. Uh, renewables are going to stay important. The, the, the importance uh, in, in ratcheting up investments there is, is, is clearly growing uh, and will continue to grow. But equally, there's going to be a, uh, a, a renewed focus on, on trying to increase uh, fossil fuel production uh, and, 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 and from, from sources that could, you know, would be deemed as being more secure. So I just, I just think the, um, it, 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 it's, it's showing a need for some balance in the dialogue, where I think perhaps before it was you know, much more a dialogue, but you know, it's the renewables that will, will drive the, uh, the energy complex you know, going forward, and, and that is certainly the case. But, but I think it's, it's a case of, of, of some time in the future. The transition will be a long one. Um, and, and, and that will, uh, you know, that will, that will create opportunities. Um, Shara said, uh, you know, governance and, and, and reacting to change. You know, for me, um, governance is the key to ESG. Uh, without good governance, um, you're not going to be able to meet your objectives. You're not going to create the right kind of programs. You're not going to have the right kind of controls. You're not going to have the right kind of follow-up. You're not going to have the right kind of reporting. Um, and when you see the kind of change we're going through now, it just underscores again. You know how important governance is for for companies to uh, you know to really um, control what they're doing and 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 uh, you know kind of steer 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 the ship in in, in, in the direction they want it to go. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Very interesting comments, and it's also a very good link in terms of what we're going to see on the road map ahead. Um, Chiara. You have a lot of history and a lot of background and activity overall as a Y on the subject. So perhaps you can uh, tell us a bit more. How do you see the roadmap ahead? Um, what are we to foresee in terms of how the shipping industry specifically manages, both in the medium, in the short, medium, and longer term? Before I answer that, can I take one minute to spark the discussion and kindly debate Fagelis on his previous comment? If it's OK with that. So, uh, my kind of objection is that the E was always there. I mean, the, the CSR acronyms and all the acronyms, CSZ, triple bottom line, the basic underlying concept is the same. Sustainable development has three pillars, economic, social, and environmental pillar. And CSR was probably the most misconceived concept in this context because it was never about the social only part. It was about the social challenges 
that had to do with the three pillars, the economic, social, and environmental challenges. It's true that most companies in the shipping sector and other sectors perceive CSR just as a philanthropic type of initiative for specific social needs. That's what happened in reality. But truth is that the E was always there. The E was were, were the main subject that were um, initiated in the Brutland uh, report in Rio back in 87 or something. So I think you're right on the, on the fact that we lose focus, we, we stay on the hypes and the jargon and the terms, but the underlying principle has always been the same, sustainable development and how we contribute to it has three pillars. The G has to do with how companies are structured to address these challenges. And coming back to you so I don't hijack the whole time. Um, uh, can I? I was trying to agree with this. It does not. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I fully agree with that. I was talking about the perception. Yeah, true. It's true. The perception was yeah. totally wrong, and that's Especially why. Especially in shipping. It, it no, needed no, no, a change no, in, in, in the, in the acronym. Yeah. It's, it's, it's true. Uh, so, regarding what's coming next, I think for the sector, as I said before, emphasis needs to be placed not just on mitigation of climate change, but also on adaptation. And this has a lot to do uh, with the physical risks. Um, physical risks are acute and chronic, and they come in different time horizons. So uh, what we've seen from the market, and, uh, and if we go back to the disclosure context, it has a lot to do with TCFD, the Financial uh, Stability Board's recommendation on, on climate disclosures, is that in order to uh, develop your strategies and uh, identify risks and mitigate these risks, uh, shipping sector companies really need to focus on climate scenario analysis. This is very prominent because all the decarbonization journey and all the net zero ambitions have a lot to do with the global community reaching the 1.5 degree the Paris Agreement. What happens if we don't? So different climate scenarios should come into play, hothouse scenarios, disorderly scenarios that bring both different transition and uh, risks and opportunities and what happens in these scenarios under the different physical risks that come about. So how this will affect your routes, how it will affect the safety of the crew, how it will affect the financial um, uh, impacts of the operational uh, detours or um, delays or even um, business continuity uh, effects that will come from climate. So I think emphasis needs to, to be placed there and um, understand that the net zero ambition is, is not in isolation, has to do a lot with what will actually will happen with the physical phenomenon of climate change. In terms of the actual fleet profiles and the impact that this has, uh, perhaps Harris, in one minute you can give us a, a recap in terms of how this is impacting you know, your, your fleet choices. Of course, thank you, Anthony. This is a billion dollar it's question. It's a billion dollar so, question. But I will try to make minute. it one minute. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, growing our fleet has always been a core element of the Starbucks strategy. And if one were to look at the last five years, we have more than doubled our fleet in, in number of vessels, mostly through acquisitions of existing fleets. And we continuously to we continue to be on the outlook for accretive M&A opportunities. Now, admittedly, the, the part of VSG uh, moving forward will be affecting our fleet plans. As we've already touched upon, we have the IMO goals, we have the short and medium term goals of VXI and CII, and then we have the 2050 goals. Starting with the short and medium term goals, uh, we need to continuously monitor the performance of our fleet, and, and George touched upon the challenge mm -hmm. to have accurate and reliable data in order to be able to, uh, to understand the performance of your fleet in order to make sure that your, ve your vessels are complying with the IMO targets. And this is not something far away in the future. Uh, EXI kicks in, uh, in uh, 2023, and, and CII, the, the same for CII, which will be changing up to 2030. Uh, so as a company, uh, we are paying a lot of attention to the performance of our vessels, making sure that uh, they will be complying moving forward with environmental regulations. And in the cases where we do have issues, we need to take action. And this action could be, for example, uh, taking technical measures, which could be energy saving devices or operational measures um, like advanced hull coating, uh, new technologies on, on, on hull cleaning, even reducing speeds. 
Um, uh, so specifically for our fleet plans, this means that any new vessel or any, any new fleet that we'll be looking into acquiring from now onwards, we need to make sure that the vessels are energy efficient enough in order to comply with the IMO targets moving forward. And, and just, just a note on the longer run, which is 2050, there it is well known by now, but for, that for the industry to reach this goal, we absolutely need uh, to, to burn at least for part of the global fleet what we call zero emission fuels. Now, this could be biofuels, it could be hydrogen derived fuels like green ammonia, green hydrogen, green methanol. Uh, and the, uh, there's a lot of commendable work being done nowadays across um, the industry, and the analysis shows that so far each one of these green fuels has its pros and cons. Biofuels are available, but they have supply constraints. Uh, green ammonia, uh, is scalable, but it is highly toxic. Green methanol, we have the engine today, but you need carbon in order to produce it in the future. Uh, so there's no perfect solution at the moment. Uh, and, and for as long as there, there is this uncertainty, and, and I would add here one more uh, uncertain element, which is the cost. All these uh, new fuels are expected to be much more expensive than conventional fuels. And therefore, we need to work as an industry on the policy mechanisms and the commercial agreements that will be necessary in order to bridge this competitiveness gap. So for as long as we have uncertainty on, on, uh, on the technical aspect, uh, the availability and the cost element of these green fuels, uh, we as a company do not have any immediate plans to place new order vessels. Uh, but we do um, strategically participate in the dialogue and in the research with regards to all these green fuels. And we very recently also announced an iron ore consortium along with uh, BHP, Rio Tinto and Oldendorf for the establishment of a, of a green corridor that will take place between Australia and East Asia for green ammonia. And this is just one example of a partnership uh, that can help towards uh, implementation of uh, decarbonizing a specific trade route of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Harris, and thank you to all the panelists for the interesting points uh, that we have all shared. Uh, I think the, the biggest conclusion is, again, the wider industry working together to follow up from the latest comment also of Harris in terms of how we move the discussion further. It is a very interesting subject, ESG, and it is also a subject that is drastically evolving. Um, I know that we said ESG is a priority. It's not just a tick box. And I will leave us with these thoughts and the summary that how an important subject it, this is and how this is evolving quite dynamically also in the years to come, based from the feedback that we've also had in the last couple of years and the events that are happening. Thank you.